We have uh, the Port Hampton lecture tonight from Field to Healed, Medical Care for Veterans in Hampton Roads. Uh, this is from uh, Alexandra Ali Kalita. Am I saying that right? Uh, she's the archivist for the Fort Monroe Authority in Hampton, Virginia. Her responsibilities include the management of a vast physical and digital collection documenting the military and social history of the land known today as Old Point Comfort. With an MA in public history from James Madison University, she has also served as the assistant curator at the Virginia Holocaust Museum in Richmond, Virginia, and the archivist for the U.S. Army Women's Museum at Fort Lee, Virginia. She has provided resources for numerous publications, exhibits, and documentaries and was instrumental in the gallery redesign of the Army Women's Museum, which reopened in 2018. Her priority as an archivist is to unsilence voices within archival collections and document uh, lived experiences through oral history collections. So welcome Allie to us. And Allie, come, come on up. All right. Don't I is the mic on, I'm guessing. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Perfect. All right, well, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, thanks to Hampton History Museum for having me. It is a really great opportunity. I've been doing a lot of research on the origins really of the Veterans Affairs Medical Center here in Hampton. And turns out, right after they asked me to sort of come and give this presentation, the VA released a report discussing closing several of the locations of the VA, including Hampton. So I thought this is a really great opportunity to sort of discuss the history behind the VA Medical Center here and also the historical significance that we can learn from doing research. So if they do close Hampton, they are going to build a new location, no worries, <laughs> but uh, it is under discussion. Now, just briefly to discuss sort of preserving the VA Medical Center, there was a nomination prepared to put the Medical Center on the National Register for Historic Places in 1994, and that nomination was actually never submitted. And then the National Park Service did a lot of research on the locations for the National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers in the early 2000s. This included the Hampton VA Medical Center. And they determined that as most of the buildings dated from the 1880s to the 1930s, at Hampton were slated for demolition in the next few years, they were not going to submit it. So those buildings have since been demolished, and unfortunately there is not much physically standing at the location that uh, dates back to a lot of the time periods we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to give you here a timeline of the origins of the VA Medical Center in Hampton. And it really begins with the Chesapeake Female Seminary or the Chesapeake Female College, which is incorporated into, in 1854. Unfortunately, they have a lot of medical struggles there and they didn't actually start teaching classes until several years later. But this was a Baptist run women's college for wealthy Virginians to send their daughters to. And I was reading a lot about it I was under the assumption it was probably like a finishing school of sorts for women. That's not the case. Uh, it was actually very well-developed science curriculum as well as your oil painting, foreign languages, uh, and music as well. So very interesting origin here. But they did struggle financially. And in 1861, they had to shut down. It was briefly held by the Confederacy, but uh, the Union took it over shortly after that. And as the Civil War begins, there's a dire need for medical facilities in the area. So Fort Monroe has a small station hospital, which is directly inside the main gate. 
and it does not have the capacity to treat the number of wounded soldiers that are coming in on hospital trains and hospital ships during the Civil War. So they briefly take over the Hygieia, but the Hygieia also cannot sustain the number of patients coming in. And eventually they requisition the Chesapeake Female Seminary and it becomes the Chesapeake Military Hospital. This quickly expands into what's become known as the Hampton Military Hospital. Chesapeake is for officers, Hampton is for enlisted men, and the whole complex becomes known as the US General Hospital, Fortress Monroe. And as the war ends, they have this really great facility and they realize that there are a lot of volunteer soldiers that they have no long-term care plan for. So we're sort of familiar today with the draft and draftees. During the Civil War, there was a small standing army and the army relied again on a lot of volunteers, a lot of draftees who did not receive the same army benefits at the time. So they created what became known as the National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers. Uh, they formed a board in 1866 and they elected General Benjamin Butler as the president. So tied to Fort Monroe there. They opened three branches very quickly in the late 1860s. And Benjamin Butler realizes that we need a long-term pl care plan, not just for white soldiers who served in the Civil War, but for United States colored troops as well. So he chooses Hampton, the former site of the Chesapeake Military Hospital, as the location for what is, becomes known as the Southern Branch of the National Soldiers Home. And this branch is specifically planned for the care of US colored troops. Now this doesn't last for long. White soldiers, white veterans also come to the Southern Branch, but the idea is that the Southern Branch in the Southern states is closer to the location of many of the homes of the US colored troops who were drawn from the South. It is uh, at this time the southernmost branch it is not the first branch of the National Soldiers Home to admit U.S. colored troops. That's actually the central branch, which is in Ohio. So in 1870, the southern branch opens its doors and serves as the National Soldiers Home for decades until World War I begins. And at this point, the Army needs a debarkation hospital. They are transporting thousands of troops overseas. And the National Soldiers Home, again, provides this really excellent medical facility that is already there, is already staffed. So they requisition the hospital, and they turn it into debarkation hospital number 51 in 1918. This doesn't last very long. Obviously, we're only in World War I for a short period of time. But then they have a bunch of soldiers returning home from combat. And again, there's a need for the rehabilitation of soldiers. So during the Civil War, they provided long-term disability care in the National Soldiers Home. The government doesn't want to sustain that for World War I veterans returning. So they focus more on rehabilitation and returning them to occupations at this time. And they open General Hospital number 43 in the same location and that is the premier psychotherapeutic hospital of the army during that time. Now, again, this doesn't last very long. <laughs> and in 1920, the hospital is turned back over to the National Soldiers Home. 10 years later, the National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers merges with the Veterans Administration. And today we have Veterans Affairs. So uh, in the years following 1930, that center becomes known as the Kikatan Veterans Administration Center, and today we know it as the Hampton VA. So in 
So I'm gonna really use the VA hospital and its physical location to talk about veteran care during the Civil War and then through the interwars period here up until and through World War I. And I'm gonna talk about three subjects that for me have been largely silenced in the historical narrative. And those include the experiences of black soldiers in a segregated army, the experiences of women as medical professionals, and the early acknowledgement and treatment of trauma in veterans. We're gonna begin here with the experiences of the United States colored troops. And on the left-hand side of the screen, you see a communication from the US General Hospital at Fortress Monroe, which is in our archives. And it's actually a discussion of three soldiers convalescing in hospital sent to their commanding officer. And the three soldiers are a part of the 30th Regiment US Colored Infantry. So this is really interesting because for one, the 30th Regiment participated in the Battle of the Crater. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Battle of the Crater, but it is uh, in Petersburg, Virginia, and Union troops dug a trench, um, filled it with gunpowder, exploded, created a crater, hence the Battle of the Crater. But even though it was supposed to be an instrumental Union victory, Union soldiers went into the crater, got stuck in there, Confederate soldiers fired upon them. They sent US colored troops in as the second wave, and they were largely decimated without uh, su the surprise attack. And those who surrendered were uh, massacred by the Confederate troops. So it was a devastating loss for the US colored troops. There was some speculation uh, by the public, by the army, that US colored troops weren't valuable soldiers. It was a failure on their behalf rather than just a, a strategic failure overall. And it's interesting to see these three convalescing in the US General Hospital here, but it does provide evidence that, though no doubt there would have been segregated wards within the hospital, US colored troops are being treated in the same hospital as white troops. Um, some of them are, if you look closely. So um, there, we had some speculation at first. There is a contraband hospital on Fort Monroe that is treating contraband. So these are the, the freedom seekers, the self-emancipators who are fleeing the institution of slavery. And there was some speculation whether US colored troops would have been treated in that hospital instead. So this is really excellent proof that the Army did um, care for their treatment and provided this service for them. Now moving on into the, the foundation of the National Soldiers Home, this photograph in the center here is actually taken on the steps of the southern branch of the National Soldiers Home in Hampton at the location of the modern day VA Medical Center. And if you look closely, there are, I'm not sure the, the gentleman in the wheelchair, but in the sort of left center and in the front left, there are several U former US colored troops in this photograph pictured amongst the white soldiers as well. And uh, there is speculation about whether the Southern Branch of the National Soldiers Home was the first federal facility specifically planned and established as an integrated facility. So it's really significant that uh, the government, the federal government, is planning in advance for the continued long-term care of US colored troops after the Civil War. The National Soldiers Home was lauded as this egalitarian facility in its reports, but 
there was definitely segregated barracks, and they definitely ate at separate tables in the dining halls. So the level of integration only went so far. In the 1878 report for the National Soldiers' Home, it lists the number of former U.S. colored troops as 39 of the 1,080 residents at the Soldiers' Home. So that makes up about 3 to 4 percent of the home, where it's pretty much about 10 percent of the Army was U.S. colored troops. Um, but this is higher than the average across the National Soldiers Home of 2.5% U.S. colored troops. So a larger number of U.S. colored troops here in the home in Hampton. And then on the right-hand side here, I'm providing a document for James A. Bailey. And all residents of the National Soldiers Home had these reports within a, a big old register. Uh, James A. Bailey was part of the 7th Regiment, U.S. Colored Infantry. And at the top right, it actually gives his military history and how he was wounded, the battles in which he, was, in which he fought. So James Bailey was wounded uh, by a gunshot wound at Fort Gilmer, which again provides another interesting military significance if you know a lot about battle strategy at the time. Uh, after the Battle of the Crater happened, Benjamin Butler continues on his campaign in Richmond, in the Richmond area, and he sends a, a huge number of U.S. color troops to the Battle of Newmarket Heights, which is a little bit east of Richmond. And the U.S. color troops successfully take Newmarket Heights. Um, it's believed that Benjamin Butler put such a large number of troops to sort of a small strategic point in order to give the U.S. colored troops this excellent win after the supposed failure at the Battle of the Crater. But just a day later, several of those U.S. colored troop units are sent to Fort Gilmer, and they're utterly massacred at Fort Gilmer because they are outnumbered and outmaneuvered. Uh, so again, just another interesting look there at the use of U.S. colored troops during the war. But it is interesting, he ends up at Hampton. And his home history, which is that third section there, is really interesting. I know you probably can't see it from where you sit, but it shows that he was transferred to the mountain branch of the National Soldiers' Home in 1918. Uh, the Mountain Branch is in Johnson City, Tennessee. And this shows you when the home is requisitioned by the Army during World War I for that debarkation hospital. So it shows Bailey is transferred back to the Southern Branch in 1920 when they close General Hospital Number 43. Now, women have always served alongside the Army in many capacities, but especially as volunteer nurses. And it's really interesting how the nurse corps is formalized during the Civil War and organized during the Civil War. Now, Dorothea Dix and Clara Barton at different times serve as sort of the head of the corps of nurses. And in 1862, Dorothea Dix publishes Circular Number 8, and she calls for matronly women to serve in her nurse corps. They had to be not below 35 and not above 50. And I think this is really important to mention because she was looking for widows and married women to serve for the purpose of them not getting into trouble with the army. The circular is also very interesting in that it says their compensation will be 40 cents a day plus subsistence and transportation to and from their postings. So on the left-hand side of the screen here, you see a communication which is in our archive at Fort Monroe. And it is the assistant surgeon at the general hospital requesting transportation from the quartermaster for one of his female nurses 
Miss O.L. Lamprey. I love how in parentheses he specifies she is a female nurse. So we must be obvious about it. But uh, really interesting, it, it supports Circular 8 in that their transportation will be provided for. Unfortunately, I have looked everywhere for Miss O.L. Lamprey and I cannot find her, and that is probably because she has married and her last name has changed. But we also have the story of Lucina Emerson Whitney in the archive, and she is really fascinating. She's from Ohio, and two of her sons actually enlisted in the 67th Regiment Ohio Infantry. They were sent to Virginia, and their unit was just devastated by disease. So she wanted to help care for her sons. She travels to Washington, D.C., uh, joins Dorothea Dix's Corps of Nurses, and she is assigned to Hampton Military Hospital in 1863. So she serves there for the duration of the war, so about two years. Um, and Hampton, again, is the hospital that cared primarily for enlisted men, so that is what she's doing at this time. Additionally, Dorothea Dix herself took many trips to the general, general hospital here in Hampton, and I know it's pretty uh, significant Hampton history that she helped fund the Union Soldiers Monument in Hampton National Cemetery as well. So she has a very uh, strong tie here to Hampton. She actually visited Fort Monroe in June of 1861. She returned to DC, sent the president a little note that said, hey, I've got the details on my trip to Fortress Monroe. Let me know when you want to talk about them. Um, now, this is just my speculation, but for me, I think she was witness to the number of contrabands coming into Fortress Monroe and wanted to talk to the president about it. But she has another nurse here, Mary Keene, and Mary is in frequent conversation with Dorothea Dix. She is assigned to the Chesapeake Military Hospital in 1864. And later claims in her writing that she suffers from nervous exhaustion. So really interesting here in that we don't often think about the women who served in, in what we think of as support roles and the sites that they see on a daily basis and how that might affect their mental health in the future. Now because at this time this is a completely volunteer nurse corps, uh, nurses are not offered veterans benefits after the end of the war. So while you do have the soldier's home, which is open for the continued long-term treatment of veterans, these women, like Mary Keene, unfortunately, spent the rest of their lives trying to cope on their own. And that leads me into the early acknowledgement and treatment of trauma and the National Soldiers Home provides a really interesting look at an early understanding of ongoing trauma within veterans. And for me, the way I'm interpreting this is because it's really the first time we're congregating a lot of veterans in one location and you have a medical team on hand at all times, you have an administrative staff on hand at all times that are observing soldiers, observing these veterans. And it quickly becomes clear in the reports of the National Soldiers Home that many of these Civil War veterans are self-medicating through alcohol. So there's rampant alcoholism at these homes. In 1876, a dysentery epidemic kills 17 individuals in the Hampton branch of the National Soldiers Home. And the doctor, the Home physician, Dr. Wright, is floored by the high mortality rate. And he posits that this is because of the alcohol dependency of the soldiers in that their liver and bowels were already affected. So dysentery just came through and, and wiped out their diminished states. In the 1878 Southern Branch Report, they say that 18 residents had been dishonorably discharged 
50% of which were done so that year for incorrigible drunkenness. 14 that year were treated for alcoholism. And eight residents were listed as being totally or partially, partially insane. In 1908, go ahead. Absolutely. So 30 years later, in the 1908 report, uh, the governor of the branch says that discipline of the branch has been fair, but owing to its close proximity to Phoebus, much drunkenness occurs. So there was an issue with the southern branch of veterans, of residents of the soldier's home going to the saloons in Phoebus and uh, being arrested for public drunkenness frequently. In that same 1908 report, 927 out of the 1,424 offenses by members of the home were for alcohol-related reasons, and that amounts to about 60%. So prior to 1906, the National Soldiers' Homes all had canteens inside them, and these were to prevent soldiers from going out into the local communities drinking and essentially causing a scene. But drunkenness became such an issue within the home itself that all of these canteens were closed in 1906 by the governors of the National Soldiers' Homes. The governor in the Southern Branch here in Hampton said that he would close the gates of the home for five days following the payment of the pensions to the soldiers for the safety of those members who cannot resist temptation and would squander their pensions. So I am interpreting this really as an early acknowledgement of trauma, of um, self-medication, and of self-destruction. And though perhaps it's misguided to lock the soldiers into the home for five days following the issuing of their pensions, it was an early organized attempt by the federal government, in a way, of treating this trauma. Obviously, there was little understanding at the time of the science behind this and how best it could be treated. And you can see this in the article on the right-hand side uh, in that in addition to the rampant articles in the newspaper on arrests for drunkenness, there are many talking about attempts of veterans within the National Soldiers' Home to end their own lives. This article is from 1910. and. At the end of the article, there is some speculation as to why this man attempted to take his life. And it says that authorities of the home are unable to tell why he attempted to commit suicide. And for me, that's very interesting in that I think today, a lot of us could discuss the many things weighing on these individuals that might contribute to depression, to anxiety, to uh, an attempt to die by suicide. But in 1910, there was not enough science, there was not enough research that had been done to really understand and to treat mental health in this fashion. Yes. Yes, and that's a, that's a case that follows pretty much any military installation you have. But yes, absolutely. Uh, so moving on. So then we, we transition into World War I and how the Army progresses at this time. And you still have a heavily segregated Army by the time we enter World War I. And in fact, after Reconstruction, you could probably posit that discrimination and prejudice are worse 
during this period of time. Although you can still have hospitals which are treating both black soldiers and white soldiers, there are just segregated wards, so similar to civil, the Civil War. And you can see on the left-hand side here in this Daily Press article, Sergeant James Proctor, he was a member of the 314th Colored Labor Battalion. He is treated at General Hospital Number 43 alongside white patients as well. Um, unfortunately, he does die from his ailments. But what I find even more interesting during this time period are the interactions between the hospital unit, the primarily white hospital unit that is General Hospital Number 43, and uh, black communities in the area. So the staff of General Hospital Number 43 actually creates its own baseball team during this time. Baseball, the American pastime, of course. We have to keep our soldiers entertained during war. So they have their own baseball team and they play teams in the area. And in The Orphan, which is the newsletter for General Hospital number 43, they have these two consecutive baseball games, May 17th, May 18th. The first baseball game they play is against Hampton Institute, so uh, black university. And the second baseball game they play is against Camp Alexander. So when I started looking into this, I had no idea what Camp Alexander was, and I'm from this area, so I felt very bad. <laughs> but Camp Alexander was uh, created during World War I as an embarkation camp in Newport News, and it was largely for black stevedore and labor regiments. They shipped 50,000 black soldiers overseas during the duration of the war. And Camp Alexander itself is named after 2nd Lieutenant John Alexander, who was the second black graduate of the US Military Academy at West Point. So again, all this history I'm unfamiliar with. But if you read the article about playing Camp Alexander, it reads, the Camp Alexander bunch play baseball. That's just it. They do little else. It being said that their time is spent in practice and have very little soldierly duties to attend to. They are well trained, well organized. So I was reading this and I'm like, okay, this is sort of a backhanded compliment, right? So you have the fact that th this is a tough team to play. They're tough opponents in regards to baseball. And yet there's that offensive language in there about them not attending to their soldierly duties and them not being good soldiers. So I, I don't know, racism is at play there. In my opinion, I would presume so. It also goes to show you the division of labor at the time in that a hospital unit, while there are enlisted men, they would have been very well trained, uh, a hospital unit is often staffed by physicians and surgeons who are all officers. So you have a very skilled occupation in General Hospital number 43, and at Camp Alexander you have stevedore and labor regiments, uh, which is considered lesser skilled, lesser educated labor, hard labor, if you will. So I think that that insinuation within the words there is a really interesting look at the separation of labor and at race relations during this time. And we're going to wrap up with a discussion of reconstruction aids and the, again, treatment of trauma during World War I. So women served as reconstruction aids during World War I. And reconstruction aides are essentially what are called physical therapists and occupational therapists today. So reconstruction aides are credited with the essential development of the field of occupational therapy, which is a very significant field in the medical field today. And they served as civilian employees with the medical department during World War I. They included highly trained specialists, but they also included artists, and craftswomen, and the idea was that they 
would work with returning soldiers and treat both their physical ailments but also their mental ailments. So again, at this time, General Hospital number 43 becomes the only, in 1919, hospital for the psychotherapeutic care of soldiers returning from World War I. These occupational therapists worked to treat soldiers' battle neuroses through handicrafts in many cases. And the idea was that in using their hands, it would occupy both their hands themselves, hopefully eradicating any tremors they might be experiencing, but it would also occupy their minds and take their minds off of the trauma they experienced in World War I. So this is a huge new development during World War I. It was uh, put in place several, well, many years earlier actually with Dorothea Dix, again we go back to Dix, who was a huge proponent of mental health reform beginning around the 1830s. And she believed that we should do away with the asylum, we should do away with the isolation of individuals, and she promoted the idea of treating people struggling with what they termed insanity uh, together. So again, occupational therapists, reconstruction aides at this time, did not isolate their patients. They worked with them together. The nurses worked amongst them, lived amongst the soldiers. And they even uh, formed sports teams where the female reconstruction aides would play against the soldiers in order to help rehabilitate them. So it is very interesting if you look at the left-hand article here, uh, and this is not even in a local newspaper, so this request was going out across the United States. Uh, General Hospital number 43 is asking for the donation of empty cigar boxes, and while I don't know the exact use of the cigar boxes, we can presume that they would have been used in one of these crafts in order to occupy the soldiers. And again, the idea at this time is that these soldiers will be initially returned to the battlefield and then eventually returned to their occupations. So the Army is no longer interested in the long-term extended care of veterans. They want rehabilitation first and foremost, and then continued care. And it's really interesting if you look at the medical reports for General Hospital number 43 that they send to the medical department in 1919, they are lauding the reconstruction department in that both patients and staff have taken advantage of the facilities for educational and vocational training in handcrafts, typewriting, wood shop, electricity, auto mechanics, radio, and Morse code, among others. So not only are they helping to rehabilitate patients, occupying their hands, occupying their minds, but they are in many ways offering both staff and patients job training that they might not have been able to uh, get elsewhere. So again, this all feeds into the Army desire to return these individuals to occupations in society. So number 43, General Hospital number 43, becomes the only hospital treating psychotherapeutic cases by 1919. Prior to that, there had been two other hospitals that were doing likewise in the United States. There were several also overseas. And one of the key ideas for treating shell shock or trauma at this time, PTSD, what we know today, was expedient treatment. It was important to treat anyone showing signs of shell shock immediately. And so General Hospital number 43 became the prime location for this because it was at that port 
of debarkation that these soldiers are returning to. They could easily receive treatment quickly. They didn't have to be transferred or transported anywhere else in the United States. So in a report of August 12, 1919, General Hospital number 43 astronomically exceeded all other hospitals in the treatment of what they term mental cases. They had 1,087 patients in August, and that number had dropped to 470 by December. And four months later, in March 1920, the hospital was turned back over to the National Soldiers' Home on account of the Army issuing a report that said all individuals had been treated and cured of shell shock or transferred to long-term facilities. This to me is really flooring in that despite the advances the Army has made in the treatment of trauma during this time, it goes to show you there's still not a clear understanding of the long-term effects of trauma on an individual in that they believe these individuals have been cured and can be sent home with no lasting effects. Uh, so you can sort of see that despite the, the huge steps they've made in World War I, there is still confusion over how we both view and treat trauma. And I do love the, the article on the right um, talks about singing classes at General Hospital number 43. And they would bring the soldiers into a class and have them sing to occupy their minds. But there is um, a sentence that says, with minds clouded from the strain and hardships of hideous experience, they gather in the auditorium of the theater and for 20 minutes join serenely in a chorus of popular songs. Not always on the key, not always in perfect harmony, but with a calmness and earnestness which probably helps a long way toward the hoped for cure of poor stricken brains. So again, it's, it's interesting here. Um, the confusion, the misunderstanding over long-term trauma and the treatment of such in that singing can bring joy and brighten our days uh, in, a, in hopefully what they want to be a long-term effect. But they do turn the hospital over to the National Soldiers Home and in 1930 it becomes the closest form to the VA Medical Center we know today. However, I think that the history of the home, the origins of the medical center here, is really significant. It has shed a lot of light for me as a historian and as an archivist on some subjects that aren't discussed a whole lot in the historical field and the historical narrative. And I think that it's really invaluable for us to have these discussions. So I will open up the floor to questions and comments. I do hold, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little weird feedback here. Do Let I me tinker with the, with the, um, the volume levels over here. Uh, what let's do is, that is just weird. How about that? That's better. That's better. <laughs> uh, because I want to record these, uh, if you'll ask your questions, rather than pass the microphone around and spread the germs that I have, uh, I'll just repeat the question, and then Allie will answer for you. So uh, yes, sir. I think the question is about a uh, relationship between the nursing program at Hampton Institute and the VA and if there was a, a crossover. So I will say I 
don't know exactly, but during World War I, black nurses petitioned the federal government to enlist in the Army Nurse Corps, and until 1919, they were barred from enrollment because of racism of the time, um, which is really flooring in that the number of nurses available for the Army Nurse Corps was low, and the Army was putting advertisements out, calling for the enlistment of nurses constantly. You had a, a large body of black nurses who said, we're trained, we want to serve, we're volunteering to serve. And until 1919, they were not allowed. The reason they were eventually enrolled in the Army Nurse Corps is because of the influenza epidemic that struck the Army. Uh, they needed black nurses to treat black soldiers stricken by influenza. All right, anyone else? Yes. I have a question. Uh, as an historian, you know, you're looking back in time, and you're looking at documents, and you're looking at the way the world was, the way Hampton was, and the way the military was. Um, you had some comments up there earlier in some, some slides about you know, the non-inclusion of blacks, and you showed a slide of the uh, steps leading up to the hospital. And I, I couldn't see it, honestly. Yeah. Um, the three guys in front of it were all white guys in, in, in uh, wheelchairs. And I, I did think I visualized a few black people in there. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are. You know, Rachel said that, that that looks like a black guy, so I don't want to get in trouble. But um, when you look back at the Civil War and the, the horrible times that followed that and Reconstruction and the poverty and then the, you know, the, the decimation of Hampton in place of, of that nature, and then shortly thereafter, the First World War and that chaos that ensued. Uh, from a, a modern historian's perspective, does it surprise you that people in that time were not overly concerned about issues of race or gender equality or things of that nature? They were sort of you know, interested in survival. I, th I think the question is about uh, uh, you know, racial and gender equality issues figuring into the development of the processes you've described tonight. Well, not really. My question was, in extremist situations when life and death is on your door and the, you know, the, the sure. destruction of the world is on your footsteps, you spent time thinking about that. So I will say that during Reconstruction, which is the time in which the southern branch of the National Soldiers' Home was open, obviously the, the Army has occupied Virginia, and in many cases there are programs put into place that allow for the advancement of the black community significantly. And of course Reconstruction ends, I believe, about 1878. So this rapidly leads to um, black codes and Jim Crow and prejudice and discrimination. In regards to your question, I would say there's some weight in that, but I think that systemically we put, we put into place a lot of institutions which allow for the pitting of people against each other. So for instance, when you are fighting for sustainability, for just the means of feeding your families and housing your family and making enough money to get by, you are going to in many ways compete with those around you. And upper class citizens of the United States across the board, in many ways, pit low-class black individuals against low-class white individuals as a means of controlling the larger numbers of lower-class people. Uh, so that's what I mean by we, we sort of create these systems that perpetuate discrimination because we allow for these things to happen. We allow for ourselves to be pitted against one another instead of
this country has been in jeopardy of being destroyed since the War of 1812 up until right after the Korean War when we had the luxury of sitting around and thinking about things we can do to make the life better. Is that, is that, is that something a historian considers? I would say that I'm not sure I entirely agree with you. I don't think that we have been in a period of desperation for that long. I think there were periods in between, uh, like Reconstruction, for instance, which is why I raised the point, where that hasn't been the case. There hasn't been such a, a dire struggle. And I think, as, as you say, we are applying maybe our present day understanding of peace. Well, you're also applying our present day understanding of how one lives. They needed much less to live back then. So did they see their experiences as a dire struggle? Because today, I might see it as a dire struggle if the internet goes out at work, right? So I think that conditions. I got point, but I appreciate you. You can go on to another question. Another question? Anyone? Yes, sir. At the end of the Civil War, it seems to me like that the veterans who had suffered grievous injuries during the war and somehow survived uh, would have been hard pressed to uh, get good care at the hospitals then. Uh, did, was there a high mortality rate for these guys that came from the Civil War that, you know, had legs and arms cut off and stuff like that, and then uh, the hospital was supposed to somehow help them survive and rehabilitate them where they could return home? Or did they stay at the hospital forever? So the National Soldiers Home uh, was both. It was short-term care and long-term care. There was a hospital there for veterans who just needed to come in for medical treatment, but the homes themselves were also created as a means of providing housing, uh, providing dining facilities. Many of them provided occupations. So for instance, the Southern Branch here in Hampton had a large farm and veterans worked um, farming the land here and that, that served as their occupation, that served as their um, sustainment. So the home itself was almost a, a federal manifestation of continued care and providing these soldiers with occupations, with entertainment. There was a library there for them. Uh, so they, there were several barracks on the campus in which soldiers lived full time. And then there were those who lived in the community who traveled purely for their medical care. They did still have a high mortality rate. Um, in most cases during the Civil War, what I understand from many of the amputations and everything at the time, if you survived the initial amputation, you were pretty good. <laughs> uh, it was the initial amputation itself where you might die from blood loss or infection. Uh, so there are, if you read the reports for the soldiers' homes, which are issued 1878, 1908, they will list the number of residents within each home who have one limb missing, two limbs missing. And there are good numbers. So while the idea of sort of disease and how that spread, bloodborne and airborne and everything at the time, was not as well advanced and mortality rates were higher, uh, they still received pretty good medical care. I, uh, uh, I can't quote chapter and verse, but I do know that the trend in battlefield mortality uh, trended uh, with a much higher survival rate after the Civil War. Uh, the Civil War was uh, almost like a self-filtering event. Mm -hmm. you, were, you were very likely to die of your wounds uh, before you left the battlefield. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, but if you look at the register of residents within the soldier's home, it'll list in their home history in many cases when they 
uh, pass away, and many of them is the early 20th century, 1910s, 1920s. So they live significantly longer after the Civil War. And then the, the homes did eventually admit uh, Spanish American War veterans and, and veterans of other wars as well, so. Yes. And I'm not going to try to translate anymore because I'm clearly missing the point, but I'm going to stand close by with the microphone. It's simply a comment that apparently Joseph Lister, in his brilliance, decided that surgeons should wash their hands between cases, and that became the practice towards the end of the Civil War. Absolutely. <laughs> But it seems like we're still struggling with that because they had to issue that when the pandemic hit, so. Even in the 1880s, they wore black, surgeons wore black coats so they could wipe their knife on their coat before they could do that safely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, I, going back to the uh, era when there was so much alcohol and a problem, uh, there was a period after payday that the gates, gates were locked to go to Phoebus, and the uh, men had to stay on the grounds, but they built a beer hall. I don't know if you ever heard about the beer yes, hall. Yes, the canteens. Mm -hmm. Five dollars, I mean, five cents a beer. And uh, that went beer. on until a group of women got together in Hampton and had it shut down. So I didn't know if people were aware of the beer hall. But Thank there you. were, there was a lot of uh, activities uh, on the grounds. There was a theater, Big theater was built there. They had shows. They worked in the theater. There's a bandstand. They had a band on the station. And they played every weekend on afternoons. People would gather horse and buggy from Phoebus and all around town, come out and listen to the concerts. And the band was also used at all the funerals uh, in the local area where they, they had the funeral at the home. And the chapel, you know, they have a chapel out there that has uh, it has Protestant and it has Jewish sides, so it, it, it addressed any, any need in, in religion. So that's, that's all I'll add for now. Thank you for sharing that. I spent 32 years working there. Ah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for coming you tonight. Some definite insight there. Yeah. I'll Greg, be. Greg, and this will be our last one. All right, just, just so everybody knows, this is Shelby Liston in the back row there. I've known her for about 20 years. Um, she's a local historian and um, she can tell you stories and stories about the VA hospital. Um, her and another lady um, did a lot of archive work, archival work there. But my question is about yellow fever. Yes. Did they, the, the VA just close their gates on yellow fever time? Yeah, so they're- they tried not to let anybody in or out for that, or how did that work out? Yeah, so as um, a soldier, I, and I might have the, details wrong, but I believe a soldier had recently, a veteran, had recently been in Cuba returning and they, he looked ill, so they were like, he's a veteran, they were like, go to the National Soldiers Home in Hampton, get your treatment. So he came in, uh, stayed at that main barracks there in the, the, Chesapeake, the old Chesapeake Female Seminary building that you can see there, and was treated, left very shortly afterwards. And then people started dying in those barracks. Um, initially, the home physician did not, this is 1898, he, 1899, they did not catch that it was yellow fever. So again, like I mentioned, there were several uh, people who would come to the home and leave for treatment. So at that point in time, another tie to public drunkenness, they found a resident of the home dead in a saloon in Phoebus. And initially they were like, he just drank himself to death. But it turned out it was yellow fever. The home physician eventually figures it out after a few cases. They immediately call up to the Surgeon General. They send down their own physicians who are trained in identifying yellow fever and treating it, and a complete quarantine goes across the area. So not only is the soldier's home quarantined, but Hampton and Phoebus are quarantined as well, and I believe it extends out towards Newport News. Like It extends uh, to a lot of places, and those quarantine lines, there's a strict curfew, and those quarantine lines are policed at this time. Um, and it is not until Every single home is checked by members of the Army Medical Department 
for any evidence that people had come from the home and transmitted the disease, that they would lift those quarantines one by one. So you believe that yellow fever, yellow fever started at the VA? Uh, so so some, out, some gentlemen brought it to the VA. As far as I've read from the reports, only residents in the soldier's home died from yellow fever. Um, they did send a few, I forget where they sent them, they did quarantine them from uh, Phoebus and Hampton, a few of them, but no one died from yellow fever except at the soldier's home. Why did they call it yellow fever? I, there's, yeah. and like black bile's involved. <laughs> Yes, because of that quarantine, yes. Thank you, thank you for coming tonight, Shelby. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would love to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, wonderful information. So, all right, uh, we have surpassed our allotted time, so thank you for coming out tonight in public. Thank you, Allie, for a thank wonderful you. presentation. Uh, remember to join us again. Uh, Next month, first Monday of the month, is always our lecture. Third uh, Wednesday of the month is always our concert. So come back and join us again. Thank you very much. My father had gone to uh, Fort Monroe for artillery, I mean, artillery school. Yes. And he, way back in the 20s. And anyways, he had,